Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for ILTV's weekly program, One on One with Alan Dershowitz, the show in which we give you, our viewers, the chance to have your questions answered by Professor Dershowitz, one of America's greatest legal minds. He's a leading expert on criminal and constitutional law, civil liberties, and the Arab-Israeli conflict. Professor Dershowitz, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. To begin our show, let's talk about the recent Helsinki summit between U.S. President Trump and Russian President Vladimir Putin. Our first guest is Miki Ahagonson, a senior fellow at the Jerusalem Institute for Strategic Studies. She previously served as the head of the Foreign Relations Directorate of the National Security Council in the Prime Minister's office from 2006 to 2014. She's recognized as a leading expert on Russia and military political decision making. Mickey, can you give us your scorecard of what Putin intended to do and whether he actually reached his goals at the summit? Well, President Putin goes to the meeting late. Uh, he makes an entrance, and then he appears next to President Trump as two leaders of two superpowers, two equal leaders that are discussing the fate of the world uh, out of their, their own regions. And uh, I think this is a goal in itself. Beyond the topics that were discussed, the appearance as making Russia great again, uh, Russia appears great again, they are equals, they're, dis they're appearing as equals, and uh, I think this was a goal in itself. Beyond that, there are the issues that were raised. We also understand that you have some insights based on listening to Putin discuss the Helsinki summit in Russia. Yes. Uh, after the summit, uh, President Putin gives uh, an interview to a Russian channel, a channel um, for his own audience in Russian. Um, and he says very interesting things about the meeting. Um, he says that he had very low expectations, but the meeting went so well between the two colleagues that all the issues that were uh, prepared were addressed. And what should interest us most here in Israel are a few things. He says that the agreement, the 1974 agreement, will be held. Uh, it was agreed between him and President Trump. And he also says it was discussed with the Iranian colleagues, the Russian-Iranian colleagues. And the most interesting sentence he says, and this for some reason was ignored in Israeli media and also I think international media, he says the settlement, the arrangements will be more, uh, more inclusive, bigger than just Syria. He said that. He did not elaborate. The person who was interviewing him did not ask anything, but it was the most interesting point in the conversation. What larger arrangements? What is he referring to? I don't believe he, it was just a slip of a tongue. That's very interesting. Uh, Professor Dershowitz, before we hear your reactions, we also have with us in the studio Dr. Elan Lerman, Vice President of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategic Studies. Dr. Lerman is the former Deputy Director of the National Security Council, former head of the American Jewish Committee in Israel, and is a reserve colonel in the Intelligence Corps. Professor Dershowitz, you might remember him from the time he spent as a Wexner Fellow at Harvard. I do. Yes, I do. Elan, uh, what is your scorecard of the summit from an American perspective? Uh, <clears throat> as a former student in a, in a course called Thinking About Thinking, um, sometimes you have to wonder how to think about unthinking. But in this case, um, the substance, leaving aside all the American political uh, fallouts from the summit, the substance had to do with several issues. Iran was on the table. Syria was on the table. Uh, uh, Putin certainly came away with uh, what Mickey has just described, uh, the sense that he's once again being accepted as a legitimate uh, interlocutor at the highest level. What he gave in return on the, the immediate level is a commitment to prevent the frontier between Israel and Syria from becoming a, an active Iranian playground. In the background, there's also an American-Russian uh, Jordanian agreement from November last year to prevent the Syrian-Jordanian frontier from being used by Iran to destabilize Jordan. So these are building blocks. 
uh, if there's a larger structure emerging, as is implied by what uh, Putin has said, as you've heard from Mickey, um, we should have to wait and see. This will be left, I think, to the professionals, to Pompeo, to Mattis, to talk over with Lavrov, Shoigu, and, 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 uh, and, and to be discussed at the professional level. But there is, I think, an understanding uh, by both American and Russian leaders that our part of the world must not be allowed to be dominated by Iran uh, and, and with both countries dragged into an Iranian game plan. And this is good for Israel. Well, I'm going to speculate, um, and I'm not an expert on the Russian situation like the two experts you have in the studio, distinguished experts. But we all know from the media that the Trump administration has been working on some kind of a plan or proposal uh, to present to both uh, the Israeli and Palestinian uh, authorities. It's conceivable that that's what uh, Putin had in mind when he mentioned that. It's conceivable that President Trump mentioned that fact to him and that, of course, if that were the case, uh, the Russians would very much like to be involved in any um, negotiations or plan involving Israel and the Palestinians. Is that good for Israel? Is it not good for Israel? I leave that to others, but that's a possible speculation. Look, uh, if this conversation can result in Iran staying away from Israel's borders and some control over Iran's surrogates, Hezbollah, that will have been a, a, a substantial accomplishment. And so, you know, amidst other concerns about what happened there with the president's um, uh, ill-advised statement about the intelligence communities and other things of that sort, we may actually have seen some potential positive developments on the Israeli front, and that would be welcome. Interesting. So um, it's clear that President Trump has a much different take than his critics, which include Republicans and Democrats. Uh, Senator John McCain called it one of the most disgraceful performances by an American president in memory. Mitt Romney tweeted, Trump's decision to side with Putin over American intelligence is disgraceful and detrimental to our democratic principles. John O'Brennan said that his performance exceeds the threshold of high crimes and misdemeanors and was nothing short of treasonous. So uh, let's hear now from Senate Minority Leader Chuck Schumer. Yesterday's press conference actually marks a recent low point in the history of the American presidency. Professor Dershowitz, can you bring this all together for our viewers? Yes. Uh, as usual, what we see is uh, Trump doing something that deserves criticism, and then we see Trump's opponents becoming overwrought and exaggerating the problem. Let me put it in context. Let's start with the president disagreeing with intelligence assessments. The president now said he didn't disagree, but even if he had disagreed with intelligence assessments, there's nothing wrong with that. If President Kennedy had disagreed with intelligence assessments regarding the Bay of Pigs, we would have avoided a disaster. If President Bush had uh, refused to accept uh, intelligence assessments regarding uh, Iraq and weapons of mass destruction, we would have avoided a war. So it's not a problem for a president to uh, disagree with an intelligence assessment. The problem is where he did it and with whom he did it. It was all about context. And I think the president understands that he made a mistake undercutting American intelligence in the presence of Putin and before an international audience. Look, at the end of the day, it's very important for Russia and the United States to have workable relations. Uh, the international balance would be better served uh, to completely corner Russia and leave it to become an adjunct of the, ch the grand uh, design of President Xi in dominating the Euro-Asian continent uh, would be a mistake. Um, I think it's good to keep all channels open. At the same time, there are legal issues involved and internal American political dynamics that I feel very uncomfortable going into. Many people are talking about the fact that in the joint press conference immediately following the summit, both Trump and Sp uh, Putin spoke about Israel at key points in their remarks. Um, Mickey, what's your take on this? Because in previous summits between Russian and American leaders, Israel was not such a central issue. I'll take it from the Russian perspective. Israel is a major player in the area of Syria that is 
a super important issue for uh, in Russia's strategy. Now, Israel already proved it can be uh, it can adopt constructive uh, policy, but it can also serve as a spoiler. Um, I believe I acknowledge the positive, um, even friendly relationship between the Israeli leadership and the Russian leadership. But I believe that it is the Israeli capacity to change realities in Syria that make the difference. Israel, the Prime Minister, uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu, sorry, said, we do not, uh, we will not act against Assad's regime. And I think this is the main point, because Russian interest is to have Assad control the whole country, to have a solid uh, uh, Assad regime in Syria. And if Israel does not act as a spoiler, it will definitely contribute to a more constructive dialogue with Russia on that mm -hmm. topic and others. I think one thing that this does prove is the brilliance of Prime Minister Netanyahu's outreach to Russia. Uh, I think Prime Minister Netanyahu recognized, before others recognized, that Russia is becoming more important and a larger player in the international scene, not only in relation to Syria and uh, Iran, but also in general. Whether he anticipated it because of the Trump presidency or for other reasons, I think Israel is the beneficiary of a better relationship, a more open relationship between uh, Putin's Russia and, uh, and, and Israel under Netanyahu. So I think uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu deserves considerable credit for anticipating the increased influence of Russia on the world stage. Let's shift gears now. Uh, Elan, you recently co-authored an article with uh, Dr. Efraim Inbal, uh, the president of the Jerusalem Institute for Strategic Studies, in which you discussed the growing strain in relations between Israel and the diaspora Jewry. Uh, you see this not only as a Jewish communal problem, but also a national security issue. Indeed. Many American Jews are uncomfortable with Trump, and you've expressed alarm that support for Israel is no longer a nonpartisan issue, whereas it should be bipartisan. What are your thoughts on this? Look, historically, the commitment of American Jewry uh, to the rise and, and, and uh, survival of Israel has been one of the three central pillars of the U.S.-Israeli special relationship. The side was side by side with common strategic interests and, and basically the foundational values that are, the two countries have in common. And this has always been a bipartisan affair. We are seeing tensions, some of them uh, rising from issues which are internally Israeli, like uh, the, the, our failure, I believe, to uh, run a wall, to build a wall of separation between religious establishment, the religious establishment of the power of the state. Uh, I think the, I wish we had the first uh, amendment, but we don't, and the consequences are felt in the relationship with uh, major parts of American Jewry. But uh, we add to this tension uh, unnecessarily when we are made to look or we make ourselves look as if we are endorsing one side of American politics against the other in a landscape that has become very polarized. And it is very much in our interest to roll this back a bit, to come back to the healthy policies of bipartisanship, working with both Republicans in Congress and in the White House, and with the Democrats in both houses, and at the grassroots level, in order to stabilize support for Israel uh, in, at, at, in both sides of the aisle. Well, I couldn't agree more. I agree 100 percent. Look, David Ben-Gurion made a terrible, terrible mistake for Israel, for the Jewish community, for Israeli-American relations, when he allocated so much power to the Haredi uh, ultra-Orthodox rabbinical establishment. Uh, and it has caused tremendous tensions. Uh, with American Jewry. Remember that the vast majority of American Jews are conservative, reform, and secular. Um, in some respects, American Jewry mirrors Israeli Jewry. The vast majority of Israelis are non-Orthodox, uh, certainly non-Haredi Orthodox. And American Jews feel like second-class uh, citizens in relation to the Jewish community when we're told that our rabbis 
aren't Jewish enough or our uh, uh, conversions aren't kosher enough. Uh, this is a real problem. But the more serious problem today is that Israel has become a right-left issue and a Republican-Democrat issue. You look at the election of a woman recently to a seat in Congress from the Bronx in New York who uh, is virulently anti-Israel, or somebody running for governor of New York now, Cynthia Nixon, who supports BDS and is very much anti-Israel. We're seeing young people and people on the left of the Democratic Party turning against Israel. And I'm not talking about turning against current Israeli policies. I'm talking about turning against the concept of Israel as the nation state of the Jewish people. You know, they, their excuse is they don't like the current government, but that's just an excuse. Uh, they wouldn't like any government at this point, no matter who ran it, no matter what the peace process uh, was. And so I think there's a lot of work that has to be done. Uh, for, I'll give you an example. Uh, the vast majority of Jews over the years uh, wa wanted the United States Embassy to be moved to uh, Jerusalem. But when it was President Trump who moved it to Jerusalem, a very significant number of American Jews opposed it. Because for them, anything Trump does is bad, and anything that uh, he doesn't do is good. And so um, the, is, the decision became not an American decision, a correct decision, but it became a Trump decision. And uh, with our hyperpartisanism in the United States, it became a decision that a large number of American Jews uh, opposed. And that's a serious problem for Israel. Elan, we're in a country with institutes such as Amos Yadlin's Tel Aviv-based Institute mm -hmm. for National Security Studies, the Begin Sadat uh, Center at Bar Ilan, uh, Dory Gold's D Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. What is the reason that you felt compelled to launch another strategic think tank, and uh, why in Jerusalem? Well, both Mickey and I and others in the Institute, and certainly uh, uh, General Amidor, former National Security Advisor, uh, are former practitioners as well as academics. Ephraim comes from academic life, but has also been working very closely uh, with the uh, establishment, with the defense establishment over the years. We feel the need for a place in Jerusalem that will be directed uh, essentially inward towards the Israeli decision-making elite. And increasingly, the um, center of gravity in decision-making in Israel has been shifting from Tel Aviv, where traditionally Ben Gurion, under Ben Gurion, the Ministry of Defense was the core of all national security decisions, to Jerusalem, where you have now the National Security Council, you have uh, a foreign ministry which is far more important, maybe enfeebled, maybe weak, but very important because Israel's going through a revolution in her international relations from India to the Eastern Mediterranean alliance with Greece and Cyprus to Africa to Latin America to uh, Eastern Europe and, so, and, and Russia. All of these, uh, these achievements require a greater capacity, and we seek in the Institute to enhance Israeli capacities. I have tremendous respect for what Dori is doing at the JCPA. It's essentially directed uh, outward. Uh, we are, of course, we do produce papers in English uh, for people to read, but uh, our main thrust, our main work will be towards creating a partnership between academic life and practitioners in Jerusalem, with Jerusalem among being uh, one of our topmost issues. Professor Dershowitz, what are your thoughts on this think tank? Well, I welcome uh, any additional brilliance, and we're hearing brilliance from our guest, uh, that can help solve some of the problems we've been talking about. And I welcome more thoughts, uh, more entries into the marketplace of ideas. So I wish you a yasher koch, and may you go from strength to strength and continue to do great things. Before closing today, we have one more item, which should have been just another anti-Israel BDS story buried somewhere. But the New York Times chief dance critic thought it would be appropriate to begin a review of a recent performance by Israel's Batsheva Dance Company with the scathing criticism of what he called Israel's repression of the Palestinian people and Batsheva's role as an Israeli cultural ambassador as a front for that repression. He continued with other quotes, saying, To me, they, being the dancers, look like citizens of a totalitarian state. 
So just for the sake of our viewers, uh, Batsheva actually accepts performers from all countries. Uh, there are currently dancers from 44 countries of every religion and ethnic background. Um, so he's writing a review that's actually intended to bash Israel, and this has been given legitimacy by The New York Times. Professor Dershowitz, uh, this is the new face of BDS, it seems, in which anything an Israeli does anywhere uh, could, <laughs> and, uh, you know, publication could feel free to preface the reporting by categorizing Israel as a repressive state. What are your thoughts about this? Well, no, this is the new face of the New York Times. The New York Times is no longer the newspaper of record. It is no longer objective in its reporting. It puts its opinions on the front page. It allows uh, its attitudes to be reflected in news stories. And this is about the worst example I've seen of mixing art with politics. First, it starts by calling the demonstrators human rights demonstrators. Nothing could be further from the truth. Nobody in that group has ever protested Russia, China, Cuba, uh, Venezuela, uh, Belarus. These are not human rights demonstrators. These are virulently anti-Israel demonstrators whose sole concern about protest is the nation state of the Jewish people. These are people who oppose the existence of Israel. These are people, many of whom were anti-Semites. And for the New York Times to glorify them as human rights activists is to diminish the role of human rights in the world. These people have no concern for the rights of human beings. They have only concern for opposition to uh, Israel. And so it's a real problem what's happened to the New York Times. It's a real problem what's happening to journalism in the United States where we operate in silos, where you only hear things you want to hear, read things you want to read. And I think there ought to be criticism directed at The New York Times for allowing its um, uh, uh, ob allegedly objective assessment of artistic performance to become a screen against um, Israel and an attack on the nation state of the Jewish people. Shame on the New York Times. Thanks for watching End Time Signs Updates. If you like video, please like, share, and subscribe to our channel. May God bless you, and we look forward to seeing you back again for our next video. Bye.